I think so. Okay. Mine was off. I call this meeting of the Northeast Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Item 2, board team building and training. Time. Oh, the time is 532. Sorry. Um, we have Greg Gibson with Moat Casey here to um, facilitate this evening's training. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, how are y'all? Good. Doing well, thank you. So I've um, told Shannon I've been, or Miss President, that I've been- <laughs> Call four, me Shannon. Four districts um, the last four nights and uh, oh. doing board training. And uh, last night, the. Uh, I just couldn't go to sleep. I drank coffee at the board meeting, you know, and so I'm on, um, you know, in the hotel in Corpus, and I'm on um, just flipping channels, and it's a Shark Tank, and <laughs> <coughs> you would think that would be something good to go to sleep with, and <laughs> the first gadget that they were trying to sell the sharks on was a detector for bed bugs in oh, hotel gosh. rooms oh, gosh. right off the bat so I, all night long i just kept jolting awake and it, but it was all good i never detected one if there was one there but it did plant a bad seed in my mind uh, so I, I i know uh, many of you some of you I, I do not and it's good to see those that i know and nice to meet uh, those that i don't I was superintendent in Graham ISD for three years and superintendent Crowley ISD for eight years and then superintendent in uh, San Antonio area for 11 years and recently retired and I haven't, I've trimmed but I haven't shaved since my last board meeting about 18 months ago. My wife insists on it staying trimmed and I, I just drew the line at 682 board meetings. Like that was, it's, I just like that. So I, 682 was the magic number for me. So I've been um, through a lot of board meetings as a superintendent and then my dad was my coach and English teacher and athletic director when I was in high school and he quit and got into the insurance business and uh, I thought finally you know I'm not gonna have my dad looking over my shoulder you know while I'm at school and he promptly ran for the school board and then he was on the school board which was no better than him being the coach or the athletic director. So I got to, uh, went through high school actually um, hearing a lot and thinking about and just, I guess, studying, you know, what school boards do through the lens of my father. And then in my last superintendency, I um, ran for the TRS board. I know a few of you probably know that. And so it was just an interesting phenomenon to be a superintendent that is also a board member. and. I would drive away from the district and, you know, have a 90 minute drive to Austin, which should have been about 50, but it was, it took at least 90. And um, from, from, you know, leaving my office to sitting in my chair uh, at TRS, I had to transition from a superintendent to a board member. And it was just, an, it was an interesting thing to do. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was to just go there and just be a superintendent, you know, that happened to be on the board. I wanted to be a good board member, so I kind of got obsessed with, you know, what does it mean? What does it, uh, good governance mean? You know, what does governance mean, much less good governance? And so I just really started digging in, you know, to studying that and becoming a student of it to make, hopefully, me a better board member. And then after retirement, uh, I'm the executive director for the mid-sized school uh, organization in Texas, so all the districts between 1,000 kids and 5,000 kids. I, I lobby for them and, uh, you know, support and advocate for them statewide. And I had asked uh, Mo Casey, uh, whom you all see their uh, logo on your packet, that if they could help me <clears throat> or if they could help uh, create a model for uh, board good governance training and strategic you know, planning for these mid sized schools. And they, they said, oh, that's a great idea. I thought it was just gonna be over at that. And then later I would just be passing out their cards, but it turned out to be, you're now a consultant for Moat Casey and come help us write this. And then you 
but you don't have to do any training. You don't, you'll never have to travel. And, I, and as I said, I'm four nights out from our place in Graham now. We just moved back to Graham where I'm from. Um, but I've, I find the work just really satisfying and really fun. And I guess just back to that initial, you know, becoming a board member and, you know, thinking about what it means to be a board member. So I thought this last year we would train, you know, 10 or 15 mid-sized schools and that'd be the end of it. And we've wound up training uh, somewhere around 60 or 70 um, this year. And then I think the reason I'm here is because <laughs> I didn't know that several of them decided to present at TASB, which is great, you know, but I started getting text messages. You need to come to room E425. I forgot to tell you, you know, we're, you know, we're going to talk about you and in our board train, you know, in our board presentation. So I just started bouncing from room to room and I, truthfully, our TAMS board meeting was over and I was going to go get a cup of coffee and pile on one of those sofas and just do emails, you know, until the dinner that night. But it was real edifying, I think, to go in and hear, you know, those districts. And then I think two or three of y'all, you know, had attended some of those and, um, unbeknownst to me they started saying my name and uh, then they talked about something that I think is really important for us to kind of talk about as a kickoff to this the difference probably between our um, board training and other board trainings uh, and by the way I'm certified so you get credit for it and all all that stuff so you get to check check the box I got that done recently but in instead of um, me standing up here and discussing maybe the theory of it or you know talk of powerpoint we're clicking through what does it mean to be a good board member we think it's more engaging and more authentic and a better approach for the trustees to go ahead and take a self self assessment and it's almost active learning because we're going to debrief your assessment as we learn and then that way it's not the theory of what it is it's like we're actually uh, looking at your assessment self assessment so i hate to say it but um you get a test right off the bat. <laughs> and that's probably the negative part of this. However, uh, I think it's important that before I really dig into a lot of the information that we take the self-assessment up front. And I know that feels a little bit odd, but it's about where you think, like your gut feeling right now before I say too much, and then it might sway some of your responses, if that makes sense. So we, we're gonna take it <clears throat> right up front. But just in way of introduction, uh, if we do this right tonight, there's about six things here that I guess are our learning objectives. I'm, I'm still a teacher at heart, so our, our lesson cycle tonight is um, these six major premises. And the first one is that, uh, you know, you're all individually elected trustees, and you don't have to think alike, but you do need to think together. So like as, a, as the board corporate, you need to think together. It doesn't mean you have to think alike. You just have to think together. That doesn't mean everybody thinks exactly the same. It just means you need to do that together. Um, another major premise of tonight is that the ceiling of trust uh, with the senior leader team and with the district at large, um, that ceiling of what will happen in the district, uh, the ceiling of trust is, can be no higher than the trust level of the trustees. So it's unfair to expect higher levels of trust with your senior leader team and out into the district um, than, the, than the board is exhibiting. So the board kind of sets, as my wife Otika would say, you know, if the board sneezes, the district gets a cold. And I think that always stuck with me, you know, so, and she also said if the superintendent sneezes, the district gets a cold, so be a good boy today, you know, <laughs> as I left home every morning. Uh, and a third major premise, and I probably said, should have said this before I said the one that I just said, but there's two big components to good governance. One is governance itself, and governance by definition is oversight of management. And see, that was the, that was the flip I had to make, uh, or the switch I had to flip when I went from being a superintendent and 60 minutes later I was a board member. I am now not management. I am overseeing management. And so the, a, a piece of that then is understanding what it is and then how do you define what good governance looks like 
And by the way, good governance, the good part of that, there is a standard definition for governance. There's not necessarily a standard definition for good governance. That's up to the trustees to decide what does good governance look like for us. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Sure. Well, okay, um, that's a good point. And it, the classical definition is that it's the oversight of management, not management. So that just means all management that occurs in the organization up to the pinnacle of the CEO. And yeah, the CEO is overseeing all the substructure down below that, but the, he's the boss of how many employees, Dr. Micah? About 8,700. 8,700 employees. So all of that management and the substructure of management falls under him. You oversee it in the sense that you are the boss of the superintendent. Okay, so that's all that that means. So you're, an oversight is not evaluate, oversight is not being involved, it's oversight. And so that just means basically that you're helicoptered up above it and you're getting information and reports and feedback from the superintendent on how it's going. Because you have two primary responsibilities, hire and fire the superintendent and adopt a budget every year. I mean, that, those, there are a few others, but those are the two primary responsibilities of the board. The duties of the superintendent is about 87 items long. It's in your BJA local. And I'm um, sorry, Dr. Gibson, to interrupt, just to let you all know, you gotta turn your mics on. <laughs> I just because we're I mean we're gonna sit in here and talk but sorry this is Terry Williams <laughs> yeah. okay. thank you so Miss Williams did that answer your question yes and and the last few things that you said did coincide with my thinking I just wanted it to be clear that we're not trying to get into the weeds no I, of management in just a moment I'm not going to do it right now because I don't want to sway the inventory, but in your packet in just a moment, we're going, Miss Williams, to dig a little deeper into that concept with this handout. I think when we're on that in just a moment, it will be all around the question that you're asking. So the, and the premise that um, what, what happens is you start doing a self-assessment of good governance and then if there are team trust issues, those start manifesting themselves in components of good governance, but it's really not governance that is the churn behind that, it's trust. And so we always feel like we should assess trust first and debrief trust. We believe that true with senior leader teams also. Before you start really trying to define the strategic objectives of a district, check the trust first. Because we don't, we want to kind of get that neutralized before we work on something that's more objective rather than something that is kind of more subjective, the feeling of trust. I mean, we can go into all the Stephen Covey, the speed of trust. You know, an organization travels at the speed of the trust in the organization. Kim Blanchard's ABCDs of trust. All they're trying to say is you have to stay on top of that if you want to set a strong and viable strategic direction. So that's where uh, we're talking about trust. The other uh, piece of about trust that I firmly believe and have seen evidenced over a 30-year super or 25-year superintendent, 32-year uh, total career, is if you're not working on trust and if you're not working on governance, then it's going down. It's it's not those are two uh, they're not static. They don't just stay at an even place. So if you're not working on it to make it better, good governance or team trust, then it's slipping down. And so that's the premise of why there's a requirement for y'all to have uh, annual training, because that knowledge is that if we don't work on it on a consistent basis as a team of leaders, then it just starts slipping down and down and down. So anyway, that's kind of the premise of uh, why I'm here. Again, I probably run the risk of getting run out before we start, but I'm gonna ask you to take an assessment before we ever start. So in your packet, you're going to find um, two documents, one towards the front, 
and it's labeled Team Trust Self-Analysis, and it is front and back, and then right behind that is Good Governance Inventory. Um, a few key components before you start. The we on um, Team Trust, and, and please, and don't write anything on that if, uh, if you don't mind for just a second, and I'll tell you why in just a second, on the Team Trust. But the we in Team Trust, when you do that self-assessment, are the seven trustees. That's the we, just to operationally define what the we is. And then uh, this is uh, meant to be anonymous, although I want to hand you yours back to you so you can compare yours to the average, if that makes sense. So if you're okay in the upper left-hand corner in the white space, just draw some symbol or a number or something that's only identifiable to you. And when I hand them back in a little bit, I'm just going to fan them out where only you can see what's in the upper corner, if that makes sense. That's the most scientific way I could come up with doing this. <laughs> Um, but just make some symbol in, on both inventories in the upper left-hand corner just to identify it for you. I will uh, tabulate the results. And again, they're meant to be anonymous. It's not about who said what. It's just about taking the aggregate self-pulse of where we believe we are on this. And then one more um, bit of information before I turn you loose on it. On the good governance inventory, if you don't know, then there's a response for you on there. It's don't know. And okay, so that there's your safety valve. Sometimes with new trustees, it's okay to put don't know. That's in, so, and with those that are not um, new trustees, it's okay to say don't know. You know, don't try to make it look like you know you know something that you don't know. It's a, it's a more accurate read if we know what you don't know. And then, of course, the other is a five-point Likert scale. So if you're not feeling strong feelings one way or the other, just go you know, with the middle. Fair enough. Five minutes to maybe just do a gut check on those, and we're going to collect those, and then we're going to talk about Ms. Williams' question. I'm, so <clears throat> I'm sorry. I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. On, on the good governance inventory. Yes, ma'am. Question 1.2. I'm assuming... BMV sorry. stands for Belief, Mission, and Vision. Yes, Is that you're correct. correct. I'm okay. sorry. We meant to spell that out and take all the acronyms out. Thank you. But it's Belief, Mission, and Vision. You're 100% correct.
<laughs> Is there really? That's funny. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know there was a cheat card either. Yeah. Yeah. At least you get a good Okay, one of the, um, I think I have everybody's, one of the reasons to just put the symbol on it so that we don't have a lull or you'll have to take a break right off the bat. I'm going to ask, uh, I've, I've prepared Peggy on just making a tabulation. So she's just going to put tally marks on the blank one and then just stick it back in there and hand it back to me. And then we're going to go on with answering some of the questions that Miss Williams brought up. So I just wanted y'all to know that's why I'm about to go hand this to her. That whole, there it is. I held a blank one that whole time. And I thought I lost it. And I apologize. I told the board president right here is a little notice to tell you what to say when you approach the podium. Good afternoon, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. I should have done that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just jumped right in. So we're going to go through the packet of information for just a little bit, and it gets to some of the things that Ms. William uh, um, questioned and, and, and or brought up, and then um, just have a conversation, maybe 20, uh, I'm sorry, just uh, actually, let me back up. I'm going to follow the agenda. We're going to do what's called a SWOT analysis. And I'm going to ask the superintendent to just be an active listener on this and not be a participant because this is board training and this just helps me get a good, a better feel of the district through the board members lens. And, um, I, you know, probably the biggest challenge for you is SWAT is strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. Some of you are probably familiar with it and probably have utilized the SWAT. I, you know, for 15 or 20 years, it's just when groups get together that, you know, I'm working with, you do a SWAT every single time. I think this is the one time that it's not going to reveal something we didn't know. And then it reveals something that we didn't know. Uh, it also back hearkening back to the first comment, you know, it's not, 
uh, that you have to think alike. It's just that you have to think together. And so this is kind of a, a, a activity or a process of thinking together. So everybody's really likes to do strengths and I've, I've, I've got a brand new notepad I can write as long as you want me to. But just, we're gonna we're gonna switch in just a moment to weaknesses, and that, sometimes it, 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 maybe it's easier to think about weaknesses in the terms of what's an opportunity for improvement. You know, I I, I just I like you know, and we all have opportunities for improvement. Uh, we call them OFIs at my house, and Otika opportunity for improvement. So, and Otika you know says she wants to get a shirt that says I'm with OFI, you know, and with a finger pointing to me when we walk around. And, but in any organization and in any relationship, there's always opportunities for improvement. It's going to be a little bit weird, but I'm going to turn right around and ask for opportunities. And opportunities are different than opportunities for improvement. Um, it's just, is there something that's just, that's just this close, that's just low-hanging fruit out there that Northeast ISD could get a hold of and, you know, it might improve something. That's the, that's the definition of an opportunity. And then I might ask Dr. Micah on the last one, threat. Uh, but if you'll wait, if you don't mind, sir, until after they've thought about the threats, because you you probably do have threats. And that operational definition of threat is is there something out there that's looming that, if left unaddressed, could change dramatically how we do business. You know, that's what. And so I was in a district last night that had. Uh, over 50% of their enrollment was transfer. So like open, open, okay, so guess what the first threat immediately was? If those 50% of the kids are gone next year, it's over. You know, like, we, you know, we gotta let go of half of our staff. So that, I'm just giving you an example of a threat. And, and they didn't come up with another one. That was their threat, and that makes sense. So um, and again, I've asked Dr. Micah to just you know be a good listener and just maybe make some notes. But this is the opportunity for the board to talk. So, what are the strengths of Northeast ISD? I know I, I made you take a test, and now I'm making you talk <laughs> right here, right off the bat. Leadership. Leadership. Uh, I mean, Dr. Dr. Micah, our superintendent. I think he is a strength. So I'm going to say leadership all the way to the top. All the way to the top. Is that what you're saying? I don't yes, want to put words in your mouth. Okay. That is fine. Yes, sir. All right. Transparency. Transparency. And again, and I am not going to um, make a value. I'm going to do my best to not make a value statement of each one of them. I'm just going to record them. So don't take that as lack of interest. I just don't want to make a value statement on them until we've collected them all. So leadership all the way to the top and transparency. Other strengths? Adaptability. Adaptability. We learned a little about that this past year and a half. The fiscal stewardship. Fiscal stewardship. Our magnet programs. Awesome. Magnet programs. What else is a strength? The, um, the vast knowledge of, of people that work here. Um, is that educational knowledge or subject matter or yes? It's a oh, yes. Okay. Both All yes. Above. okay. So knowledge and expertise of staff. Okay. Very good. Some of the best staff, best teachers, best administrators in the state of Texas. Teacher, best teachers and admin in the state. I don't know how to say this in a few words, <laughs> but we have, and I, it was highlighted again today when we were at MacArthur, we have a lot of, a lot of staff, teachers who have come back to Northeast. They went to Northeast, they've come back to gotcha. Northeast. And so it's sort of the return effect. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Boom, boomerang. Well, I'm going to just say re uh, returning alumni back yeah. into staff positions. Yeah. And into the community. That yeah. Was, yeah. That, to piggyback on David, you know, two of us are NEISG um, alums on the board, and we have chosen to come back to this community and raise our families. 
Very and good. There are, off, there are a lot of families in this district that are multi-generational. Very good. It says a lot, I think. Yep. We just moved back to where I grew up. It took 32 years, but we just <laughs> moved back. To... Yeah, that was one of the things we heard at MAC today. There, was, there were some students there that are fourth generation mm -hmm. MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Where do you hear that? Wow. See that? Yeah. In a large district. Yeah. Very good. I think that um, the different um, perspectives and backgrounds of our community makes us strong, so of strength. Um, I'm not, are we talking about ethnic diversity or diversity of thought or yes? Yes. Okay, yes. so, <laughs> so uh, diversity and unique perspectives yes. represented in the district, okay. All right. Our students. Tell me a little more. They are, they are resilient. I know that word has been used quite a bit the last 18 months. Not as much as pivot, but you are correct. It has I been know. Yes. So, so, but there's just not enough, you know, they're, they're drive, they're driven. Very good. So resiliency and drive in students. And let's follow that up with parents that have stepped up and cared not just for their children, but for other children, for the district, for our staff. Um, there's so many parents that have just been such heroes through everything that's gone on recently. Very good. You kind of touched on diversity. I like to kind of um, add to that diversity of executive staff and leadership, as well as administrators. I think it's a big strength and good for the district because um, it also lets the students see uh, role models right. and um, uh, it's just good for the I can look at any tier of the organization and see myself. And thank you, ma'am. Any other? Innovation. innovation. I was going to say creativity. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two for one there, innovation <laughs> and creativity. Tell a little bit more about that. Our ICIS, our new uh, cybersecurity magnet program, is there is not one in the nation like what we have at our high school down the road. We're very, very proud of that program. We have awesome. amazing students and a wonderful leadership to make that program successful. Outstanding. Well, and to piggyback on that, looking at, you know, forward thinking and seeing what's coming and creating um, classes and magnet programs to um, be able to address those needs. So being creative is where I was kind of going with it to say, you know, this was a pie in the sky idea and we made it happen. And there's other things, you know, hopefully. I, you know, I heard creativity to make it happen, but also heard strategic intent yeah. for it to align to a big need. Mm -hmm. So it's not just something being done just to be done. I right. would think cybersecurity is pretty safe for, for any for the uh, unforeseeable future. But I think to add to that, both of those pieces is the courage to do those yeah. things. I mean, the, the, the courage leadership. to innovate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would piggyback the, we have the students, our kids have lots of talents and the district has provided the opportunities through the magnet programs, other things, whether it be the performing arts, um, you know, ISA, ISCI, all those things lets them maximize their potential, whatever their God-given abilities are. And so by providing those opportunities and programs, we're providing it as a destination for many families across the community to come say, hey, I can do that, or they can go do the KSAT program at Kruger, whatever their talents and skills are, we give those opportunities to them. Very good. On top of the ABCs, of course, and the right. basics. I want to add the, I was going to say opportunities, because to piggyback on you and then what you said, but I think also opportunities for our staff and for our, our, we give a lot of, I think we have opportunities for our staff to excel, to um, jump in leadership roles and, and there's a lot of things that we offer our staff here, and I think that's one of our strengths. 
And I like to piggyback up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no more piggyback. Pig. That pig is getting heavy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to add to that adaptability piece because I think it's important, and we've seen this so much with the transition of our um, leadership is the, you know, it's so change is good. Change, mm-hmm. sometimes change is hard, but change is necessary. And the, the, mindset of we've done it this way because we've always done it this way is not necessarily healthy and it's not um, productive. It doesn't move you forward. It makes you stagnant. All right. Any other? All right. Thank you all for sharing, and I'm, I am glad I got a brand new notepad. Wait, one more. Enchilada <laughs> yeah, okay. Wednesday. Enchilada Wednesday. Our okay. cafeteria, our nutrition, um, I'm being honest, I just threw in the Enchilada Wednesday, but our nutrition department is amazing. There are many hands and big well, hearts. Yeah. Hard workers. And, and going with that, you, you, we've seen so much of that in these last couple of years. The nutrition, the transportation, mm-hmm. our custodial staff. Yes. Oh, my gosh, what our they support. have done. Um, the librarians, the counselors and nurses, the way that they have stepped up these last. It's just it's astonishing. It's gratifying. It's, it's, it makes you proud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is truly one of the, the biggest strengths. Outstanding. Yeah. Okay, we're going um, to pivot to opportunities for improvement. So what are some opportunities for improvement? And by the way, by definition, the reason a SWOT analysis is important is, um, and I've ha- I have had the benefit to um, talk to the superintendent for just a little bit before we started tonight and kind of get some context. And we have some very standard questions that we ask to have situational awareness. And so I know there's some strategic thought that, you know, he's – uh, got bouncing around in his mind or on paper maybe more than in his mind and so um, uh, p- uh, part of the whole good governance thing is to kind of check where you are uh, the timing of it is always good and it's at least good annually because it's a requirement but to do it prior to uh, something like that is always really good as well because so, you want to think about the governance team and we'll talk more about that Ms. Williams in just a little bit and then how that is, uh, how that strategic role is laying the foundation for the tactical role that the superintendent's in charge of. Um, but then you, you know, you can't. Um, one of the other reasons to do a SWOT analysis is that you can't really improve what you haven't put your finger on. You know, and you have to be able to say that. So I think, and one of the reasons I'd ask the superintendent, Dr. Micah, to just listen with a critical ear tonight, is because it's a great opportunity for him to hear this through the trustees as he's putting pen to paper on some things that he's trying to get straight uh, for a strategic direction moving fair forward. Is that fair to say, Dr. Micah? Yes, okay, sir. so he's going to stay quiet, but it's a good time to, for you guys to uh, give him some good feedback. As a new trustee, one thing that I would have found helpful and I saw some of my TASI training was a strategic calendar, because I know a lot of people here know it, but like that lays out, we've got Tapper coming due, CBAC report, the bilingual, um, budget's pretty obvious stuff now, I've learned that, but it also that we could share with the community, because there's a battle rhythm uh, um, that I think is something that may be useful because it keeps us on track as a board. And I know Dr. Mike, I'm keeping track, but like we would all have awareness of it, and one of the TASB trainings that I did online, they're talking about that strategic calendar, because it keeps us accountable to the progress in like each month that it's due and obviously there's some flex with certain programs right. not as much because it's driven by the law but that's something that because i founded several meetings y'all heard me what's the normal time of year for this or how we're doing that because i was trying to get up to speed on lots of different things and right. just lack of awareness but it would also give maybe the community awareness as well as we go through it and the staff would just get everybody on that same sheet of music oh yeah we got that coming up oh yeah i gotta think about a nominee for whatever it is okay. so that's just a thought all right um as one area of possible further enhancing stuff. I mean, everything goes well, but just make it cleaner and process driven five, 10 years from now for the long term. Gotcha, thank you, sir. Other opportunities for improvement? I would say uh, pretty broad, but community engagement. Okay, you mind and talking that, a little bit more? Um, and, and I think that's 
everything from communications to um, engaging with alumni, engaging engaging with other municipal um, entities, not municipal, public entities, whether that or or even homeowners associations, that kind of thing. And some of that I know we're working on, but we always have room for improvement and opportunity to really expand that. Well, I was going to piggyback on his idea because one of the things that we saw was some places will do like a trusty newsletter that they send out either monthly or big picture. We had a board meeting, we just passed a bond, whatever, but back to that community engagement. Hey, what we're doing at the board level, high level stuff, here's our next meeting, here are some big stuff that's coming forward. Um, would be one possible way of communicating that further enhancing that communication to the next level through whatever process it might be if that's something we thought was good as uh, a good communication mechanism okay. to add to that the um, and I don't know how this would be done but just what the process is most people most of the public they're unaware of what a board that a board meeting is a business meeting it's you know it's not a it's conducted as a business meeting and so we have certain guidelines and structures that we follow and processes and legal, legal processes yes yeah. as well but just to know the ins and outs of what how an actual board meeting is run and why we don't respond during public comment, pu public comment well, and why you know you speak at the time that you've spoken or chosen I'm sorry, written down that you're going to speak, why you're called at certain times. It's just the how our board meetings work. They're very unaware. Right. And in all fairness, I was very unaware until I, you know, accept or uh, had this position or was voted in this position. So it's, it's, it's a community awareness. And, and, our, and with responding to email, you know, when the community emails all of us, and Shannon is the board president, you know, respond so that they're not getting seven different emails and seven different answer, answers. It's a collected, uh, she's our collected voice. And so there's just a way to communicate with the community. I think it would relieve some of the stress that they're feeling. And maybe, you know, we, we all don't like the unknown. We want to be in the know. And I was going to yeah. carry on with that because I found an ISD that on their board page, they actually listed two pieces. Here's the normal process, start at the lowest level. Go to your teacher or your principal, work up through district admin, don't always go to the board. Because sometimes we get stuff that all we turn on, we send it to Dr. Micah. And uh, I have examples here I can pass out later. I just, these are just some of the big board type stuff that I came across like a newsletter and stuff that we could consider. But that was one of them exactly what you're saying is, so that we don't get some of the emails necessarily that more appropriately would have been a campus principal or somebody in the staff, depending on what the situation is. And it was a certain ISD. I can, I, I just cut and paste what it looks like. I can share that with y'all, but something we could put on ours so they don't just email us immediately because it's quick and easy. That it would help with the communication so people understand the process. And at the bottom, you talk about, you know, the respect, respect at a board meeting, the dialogue piece as well, so that people understand what's going on. We could tailor to what we believe is best for our district. And that's on their board page? It's on their, it's on their trustee board page. Okay. I got copies. I could hand this up. I didn't know the process of that and later, but it was just, these are just examples that we can decide if as a board, we want to do stuff like this and it works for us or not. But I thought it was very clean. Step one, two, three, four, and five. Well, because to Sandy's point, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, that's a great idea, but how are you going to communicate that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you're going to. Yeah, so, it was at least so before that, you get to the board email, it's at the top of their board. And I'll, I'll hand everyone copies if they want. Yeah. Is that okay if I hand? I mean, I don't know. We can wait. You we wait can till do that. Yeah. 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 But yeah. this is just an example, but it's like step one through five, and the last one is email the board at any ISD. Yeah. And, I, I think that's a really good point, too, because like Shannon responded personally to over a thousand emails last month or two months ago. And I know that that was a heavy burden on her. But at the same time, I really, I really like the idea of, of some idea of how the community can, a step, a step by step process. But I don't ever want to take away their feeling that they can email the board at any given time. Um, sure. But 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 that piece of it though is the understanding that we have designated Shannon to respond to our emails right. that come as a group. Um, but I, th I think too the, it's it's not only just how a board meeting is run, but what the board can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of misinformation, mis misunderstanding, and again, like you said, when you're 
not part of this. You don't know what the board can and cannot do. So that, that's another piece of that communications, I think, that we need to work and on. And the last piece I would talk to communication is I found if we considered putting not just the action and consent items, but all the slides, because I found a lot of times I'll re get our initial package and then I look at the briefing slides and answer most of our questions. And we know there have been times when members of the community come up here, they want to speak matters from the floor. They have seen the presentation and the presentation answers most of the questions, if not all the questions that are frequently mentioned by people. So I don't know if that's something we'd want to consider also doing is posting the briefings pre-decisional draft because obviously until we take action as a board they're not but what the staff is those big ones because i think it answers so many questions at least it does for me as i'm reviewing it over the weekend usually because we have our monday meetings but something else to further communicate with the community so they know exactly what we're looking at because obviously the staff does a good job preparing stuff most of the time there might be some changes but um, just something to talk about and maybe see if that's something we want to consider to further um, help the process in communicating with the community and parents and staff and whoever may be interested in looking at that stuff don't know okay i think another <clears throat> opportunity we have in this district is to um, expand on our student voice program we have yeah. and, and and get that to where um, those students feel not just that group of students but all students feel that's a pretty lofty goal but <laughs> all students feel heard um, and i think a lot of that the explanation of that is I think over the last year there's a lot of students who have felt that decisions are being made and they're just sort of being thrown in the mix right. on a lot of things and hearing that from my own kids um, it's, it's, I it's, should have mentioned this up front but I guess part of my pedigree with this was being a national Baldridge examiner um, for about 15 years between Crowley and Church and mm -hmm. so you know when when I hear of that it's it's either VOC or VOS, and so VOC is voice of um, staff, and or VOS is voice of staff, and VOC is voice of customer. So I, the the statement in Baldridge terms was if it falls in the category of VOC or VO VOC or uh, VOS, it's correct. Yeah, because you, you can't over listen to your staff or to your customers. What? There's no such thing as over listening. So so trying to keep them yeah engaged and excited yep. and, and how we pull them into the process. You make a great idea. Maybe, and I don't know if we, how we would set this up, but doing some sort of, I'd call it trustee listening sessions at campuses, like, you know, two or three trustees obviously have to watch the quorum, but we got and listen to the community members. And we set it up, you know, a couple of neighboring clusters where we go once a quarter and just listen to the staff or the students get feedback. And we can also provide them information like 85% of the budget we know goes towards the teacher staffing, the medical and stuff. It's fixed and some information that a lot of times they don't realize or how things are done, information, but then also listen to them just to get feedback and hear what their local concerns may be and maybe two or three weeks at a time at different parts of the district, possibly quarterly basis or something, if that made sense, some sort of listening information session. Yeah, that list, student voice. Yeah, there is a structure um, called rounding. One, of, and again, I said we're gonna, this isn't a judgment, it's just kind of a factual thing. One of the cautions with that is that um, listening is one thing. If an individual trustee just inadvertently uh, offers a correction to some issue that's brought up, they've just yeah. broken state law. Yeah. Okay. Because they're, they're the only place that a trustee can make a recommendation is to the trustee in a duly called meeting yeah. with a quorum present. But, okay. So that you just have to, it's, it's a, you can do it, but it's a needle to thread. Yeah, okay, and that that maybe, to, yeah, that, you know, we, that, that might get a little too, too too involved at the campus level, okay. but but through staff and, and the administration, I don't know what that looks like. Anyway, the well, opportunity I, is to I, really try to pull them Ms. in. Fryer, more. I think what, and, uh, and I, I know Dr. Mack is doing very well just listening and, you know, with a critical ear, but I know that he's shared to, with me building a systematic structure for listening. And so the question that I'll have in a little mm -hmm. bit is how much does the board want to know about how the listing is going. What are emerging themes? What are, you know, if it's a, if we're doing a voice of customer rounding session and it's students, how often do you all want an update on what those emerging themes are? So I'd like to, yeah. Um, one of my thoughts is in Bear County, we are unique in that we have so many school districts 
Yes. You know, and sometimes we don't know what other districts are doing though we hear about it or see something on the news. And, you know, I don't know what the mechanism might be for doing this. Maybe, maybe once a quarter. I'd like to see if maybe we can, I don't know, convene some type of meeting with other board members, just an informal type of sharing best practices, which uh, is information sharing. Gotcha. Okay. It, it, one thought I shared with Dr. Mike in the summer, but we've had a lot of challenges, was the systematic and like I'll call it strategic review of all of the board level policies one of the things where we start looking at them to make us more informed because there's tons of policies out there but we look at every couple every meeting and then we just make sure they're updated have some sort of way to track hey last time we reviewed it because some policies may be old but they don't need to be updated but it makes us more aware and it's that systematic building for the long-term process driven type thing um, we do a couple of these meetings most of them won't need changes and maybe build that process as a possible option to keep us up at that board higher oversight level make sure we have the right policies in place for dr mike and the staff to go do the actual management piece and make us aware of what's out there type stuff okay maybe well, I, do, I don't work for tasby and i'm not plugging tasby but they do offer that service i'm t just uh it is a systematic policy analysis okay. it's a pretty big undertaking it's, it's well not, it's it, not for the faint of heart to because the last time we printed a hard copy of it to my some of y'all remember those yeah it was a good yeah approaching six or at least six or seven or eight inches before it all went online not that it can be done i'm not saying that but it's just it you it really is a long-term vision right. because you can only do it in small chunks at a time and if if you try to buy it off too much my experience is it, then you're not really doing the purpose of it which is to truly analyze it because you're going so fast you can't really read everything like you're not physically it would be a long-term commitment yeah it'd be a long-term commitment yes all right so i don't know um where my idea is going to fall it may be um a threat it may be a weakness <laughs> it may be an opportunity for improvement but i, I should have said they can fall in multiple <laughs> areas um just the loss of enrollment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how to, um, an opportunity for improvement may be to seek ways to increase um, enrollment in the district. Yeah. But it also could be a threat. Or Absolutely. Right. And it, your numbers are probably bigger in aggregate than the district I was with last night, and, but it's not as big of a percentage of the whole but at the same time, if it's big enough that it changes your budget, then it's mm -hmm. it's big. It's big enough. Right. I think gonna, that goes into, um, and I was going to say that you beat me to it, mm -hmm. uh, is that, you know, com the more that we are involved in the community and getting the word out there, the I think that we might see it'd be long term, but we might see a difference in our enrollment. I mean, if people know what's happening in the district, right, um, and they really, really know it, and we open our doors, you know, when we can, right, um, I, you know, I think that we'll be able to see the effects of of that. Um, and it's also getting, and and maybe one of the things that we also that is an opportunity for improvement is like, I I know we have an outstanding communication staff, but. Um, really getting the word out there of what our district has to offer. And we offer so much, and we have so many great opportunities, um, but maybe that family doesn't know that, and so they are have to, having to seek something else out. But we, but what they're seeking out, we truly have, and, and beyond, and more. And so maybe um, just that aspect of communication and reaching out um, will help what you're saying I, you know but I think that's an opportunity yeah we the, so it's telling your story and so it, you we cannot over tell right? your story yeah. right now yeah. that's what yeah. and we were in the information age for about 30 minutes and it became <laughs> it became the opinion age yeah yeah and unfortunately <laughs> with the advent of some social media platforms and so it was supposed to solve all these problems and it just just so much opinion getting to one place at one time so t to your point, I mean, you can't overtell your story yeah. when all of that other opinion that and rarely 
I don't know, we're post-enlightenment, and that frustrates me. You know, the age of enlightenment's over. This, this will be renamed. I don't know if uh, historians will rename where we are right now. It will be. That will be interesting. It will be interesting to know what they name it. Because. I, yeah. That's okay. okay, so I have one that I kind of think is in line with all of this. It's the communication of what is happening in the state that affects public education. Okay. Telling, so not just telling your story. We need to tell the story public, to our public, public to our community, what is happening on the state level that affects our enrollment, that affects our teachers, and affects our students. And that is the public education story in addition to the Northeast ISD story. Is that we have amazing groups within our district um, rooted that tell, you know, that does that and tells the story go public we j we have these organizations that are helping to tell that story but we need to tell it on our end of you know dr micah the a great example is the recognition of how they are using our test scores in the new rating system and you know it's it's pretty easy to read between the lines if you've been um in this position for four years. Well, Dr. Mike has been in education for a very long time, so he's a speed reader. And I, um, I think we need to tell that story. Absolutely do. Um, and the following does not reflect the views of Moat Casey and Associates. <laughs> <laughs> this is Greg Gibson. But you know, for 20 something years kind of watching your schools, when I started as superintendent, maybe for a year or two, were the benevolent autocrat in the community. So benevolence good, and they were autocratic, and everybody was okay with it because they were there for the good, right? It was okay for it to be autocratic, and it really got politicized. And I think there's no coincidence, and this is the part that's not uh, part of Moat Casey, but there's no coincidence that uh, about six or eight months into the pandemic, that the polling numbers parent satisfaction of public education was strengthening and becoming the highest it had ever been because the kids went home and it's like, wow, I had no idea everything that was going on. And so the polling numbers are going up and up and up. And then we get the mask, no mask, and we get the critical race theory. And I personally believe, and I, I think there's another one coming as soon as we bounce back and, you know, we get, and it, there'll be another one, and then there'll be another one, and it's forces that are at work to draw our kids from us. I'm off of that <laughs> soapbox. I just, that's my belief, but that's my observation, I guess, from trying to back up and look at how is this happening. Yeah. It's, it's marketing. So to your point of what we were talking about, we've got to market right back, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Any other? So I think it, the last one I had, sorry, was there's always an opportunity for consistency. Okay. And, and that can have a lot of different forms. But, um, yeah. Just, just kind of a general consistency mm -hmm. across the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Knowing that we have a very diverse district and 60,000 kids, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but right. there are certain things that you know, we could make sure are consistent in everyone's daily exposure to this district. Very good. Um, so we talked about opportunities for improvement and opportunity is slightly different. And I did, I, I put uh, as an opportunity, I put you in three okay. categories cool. a while ago because I think, you know, chasing that enrollment in light of that last conversation we had is, yeah, it's, it could be a weakness because if you're losing some, it could be an opportunity. Can we keep some? And it could be a threat if we lose a lot, right? So that's a great example of an opportunity. Are there any other opportunities, not necessarily opportunity for improvement, but something that's out there, and it could be something around a strength that you mentioned or a weakness, but something that you would want uh, us to know about? Well, maybe an opportunity for to look at more um, magnet programs. Okay. And I'm going to just put that as a sub bullet under your other one. Okay. Because that's what you're saying, right? To hold enrollment 
in? Is that, or do you want those to be bifurcated, or are you okay with them being coupled? It can be coupled. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, in your thinking, is there a threat out there? I have one right now: loss of, en you know, a vast loss of enrollment. You know, I have as a threat. Are there any other threats out there that you magnet? Want? Uh, not magnet. Charter schools. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And that earlier, my little tirade was around that I apologize for going on that I promised I wasn't going to but um, it's very organized and the quicker we realize it's very organized that's not it's not random nope. it's very organized and I also see funding as a threat mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and you know we noted financial and physical stewardship as a strength so I'm assuming you're talking about just the general constriction of funding statewide for traditional public ed? Excuse me. Um, yes, but you know, also how, you know, our funding is tied to enrollment and it's, it's kind of all, uh, you know, tied together. And sometimes there are some things we have no control over right. as far as, you know, enrollment, um, but we're still subject or subjected, I should say, to, you know, whatever, um, whatever authority says, okay, well, now your funding is going to cut because of this, that, and the other. You know, COVID is, a fine, is an example. Right. So I'm just going to put state funding instability. Yeah, that, that would be a good description. Because I think that's what it is. Any other threats? There's one. It's been addressed. It's ongoing. I think it'll be here with us forever. Is the cybersecurity piece? We have a lot of people's data from employees to students, and every organization has that. I know there's lots of stuff in place, and we're constantly working to stay on the front end of it. But that's just an ongoing threat. Although we as are addressing it, um, that's just a concern because yeah. in the digital age, there's so much information electronically stored, and we saw what happened to another ISD. Yeah, I just left one or, or last week that got held ransom. It was, it was devastating. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's another piece to communications too, and Dr. Gibson, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, and that's misinformation. Um, yeah. I think that's been a big threat. Um, the, the, it, even if we, even if it, that no matter how hard our incredible communication team works to, to, to share what's really going on, the misinformation story often takes hold or takes over. I, I don't know what the answer to the threat is, but it is, it's, it's harming our students, it's harming our parents, it's harming our community. Our teachers. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. You're right, Ms. Huey, and um, I don't know what the answer is other than I guess I just try to double your own resolve to, you know, I, I've never gotten a tattoo, like, but I've considered it only for one reason. I was just gonna tattoo it right here, real small. Uh, don't talk, but if you need to, is it helpful, is it kind, is it accurate? And just to remind me, at any time I could just look down, I'm really good at accurate, by the way. Like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty good at helpful. I'm really good at accurate. You know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm 50-50 on is it kind. That's the part that, you know, I have to, I have to kind of, but um, I think if somehow just, it, we're just going to have to like put our foot down hard, you know, that it has to be helpful, accurate, and kind or just don't say it, you know, anymore in order to combat this misinformation age. Those are, um, I think you put the heavy hitters on there, loss of enrollment, cybersecurity, funding formula, <laughs> fluctuations, and charter and misinformation. Those are some pretty uh, good heavy hitters. Dr. Micah, did you have anything to add? You've done a good job of listening. You've, got, you've captured some notes. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. I, I, uh, well, that's we I appreciate the affirmation that I'm doing a good job of sitting yeah. <laughs> quiet. That's not one of my strengths. Um, you know, it's interesting because they, they hit on them. I had loss of enrollment. Uh, my revenue comment was flat revenue that we've just yeah. kind of hit a ceiling. 
Um, the only one I can add <clears throat> that I think people that aren't living every day in education, and that's not that you all don't, but you know, we're, we're sitting in, in it, is the resistance to change. You know, you alluded to it and you discussed it, but you know, I think the, the one thing that folks don't really think about when it comes to public education is we're the one experience everybody's had. Everybody has had an experience of school, whether it's homeschool, private school, public, it doesn't matter. Everybody has had it. And, they ha and because of that, they have a picture in their mind of what it should look like, right. smell like, feel like, act like. And when it doesn't meet that expectation, there is an immediate resistance to why are you doing that? And that, um, you know, you're talking about a lot of books, the, the Crucial Conversations book. Uh, the one I like is Crucial Confrontations in the sense that when people come to it, they immediately believe it's a negative and they don't come to it with a positive presupposition. Right. Yep. And so I think that's one of the threats that I see really daily. And that's just not outside entities. That's actually folks inside too. Teachers believing that it should be a certain way. A principal believing that a certain way. Some executive staff can, could be, be that way. I think all of us come up against that piece, and it's um, being able to see through that and and pushing through that barrier in order to get to something different. Yeah, that's really good. That's very insightful. That is my deep thought for this well, evening, you, Dr. You did Gibson. a good one. That's a really good one. And um, you're done now. You can't yeah. Talk anymore. <laughs> for um, us extroverts, um, it is hard, you know, to stop talking enough to let the group you know work together and that's that's really important and uh, i'm married to an introvert that's a deep thinker that reminds me regularly you know that we need to schedule time to talk it all the way through she's very appreciative of all my ideas you know and two out of a hundred work you know <laughs> so she it's, but she wants to hear all 100 to find the two but it, it takes um Dr. Micah, to your point, you know, it takes a, a it takes some group thinking, and you have to have respect for each other, and listen to each other, and be factual with each other, and truthful with each other, in order to uh, um, not be resistant to change and to look forward. Okay, thank you all for that exercise. We've got about ten minutes of some more traditional team of eight. I think that was wonderful to get a feel from you and. It's not just that Dr. Micah got a chance to listen, I got a chance to listen. I think it's good that you all got a chance to listen to each other, you know, in this environment. Again, it's not critical that you think alike, it's just critical that you think together. And so that gives you all an opportunity to know a little bit about what each other think as we went through, uh, thoughts are as we went through that. So we're in kind of the mid, the part two part of the agenda, if you're following that, and I did not, uh, Bring a PowerPoint, and I, I heard a new term the other day that I love: PowerPointlessness. Yes. You know, Thank you. okay, and no, if, no and then I heard another new one: if all you have is a PowerPoint, you actually have neither. I thought that was pretty clever. That one takes a little while to think of. Yeah, that one. Takes, neither a power nor a point. So, uh, those have really, those have really resonated with me. So, but we just put a few handouts in there, and, and hopefully, there's some that you could just go back and think on. There's an article in there that I did not necessarily want to include. Um, it just so happens that the author's obituary picture is in that article. Um, but I, uh, about 10 years ago, I had oh. the opportunity yeah, to write an article. And I really appreciate uh, it was TASB. Uh, I had a couple of board members that were on TASB board positions that you all are aware of. And um, they, I guess, were just talking to Jim Crow, probably, and he just said, well, we need to get that written out, you know. And so between TASB and TASA, we got that uh, written out. And um, I was very fortunate. I had a uh, board president that hired me in my previous job that recently passed away um, that was just uh, ex-military. You know, I had, had a lot of that on our board and just really wanted a good systems approach. And so he, he kind of gave the green light to just do a clean slate and you know start governance over I'm not necessarily saying that's what any board needs to do but um, he he had felt like that there was um, not strong intentionality and he wanted to develop the intentionality so we we just kind of do a clean slate so that's what that article is about we're not going through that article but it's in there uh, for you guys to read 
So, Ms. Williams, if I may use your question as an example. So there's a handout that uh, looks like this, and that this gets almost directly to your uh, question earlier. And um, I'll just, I mean, I'll, I'll be clear and right up front. Th this is a military construct. And um, it's, it, it's not, um, that's the derivation of it. Now, school systems and other nonprofit and for-profit have adopted this. Uh, some trustee boards that I'm working with right now, actually, once they kind of get their hands around it, they're adopting this structure as part of their board operating procedures uh, because of uh, wanting to just show efficacy towards staying in the lane. Uh, or staying in the correct role, not lane, but the correct role of the organization. TASB, um, you know, in TASB training, they'll talk about above the line and below the line, or at least they used to. I, I think they still do. That That is applicable here, you know, because there's a strategic role, and then maybe there's a line, you know, down below that where ta tactical and operational reside. But I think it's important for the trustees to know that if the board and superintendent are the strategic role, you're up here at the top, it's the 50,000 foot view. I love the last bullet on this, and I'm not gonna read these to you, but the last bullet is you work on the system, on the system. Ms. Williams, earlier you said we don't work in the system, we work on the system. So if the team of eight is not working on strategy and on the system, no one else is. It's the, only, it's the only group that can work on the system. And then you'll notice that Dr. Micah and su the superintendent is the transition from the strategic role to the tactical role. So he's, he's almost like if y'all are, if we're gonna look at the military, you know, you're, you're, you're the generals, you know, that are at the Pentagon, you know, thinking big, big, big picture. You know, that's what they do then once the mission is determined at that big picture, then it's handed off to captains, lieutenant colonels, and all that in the field, and then the operational is the front line. So that's where the soldiers are, you know, that are, so if, if you, I love to think about this, so what, what if a general from the Pentagon just showed up in Kuwait in the bunker and started telling those people on, you know, that front line how to do what they're doing? Well, first of all, the commanding officer would be really upset because that might be completely contrary to the way they modified it that morning to make it right, right? Even they just they had modified something that morning. And so now they're in, and the general wasn't aware. <laughs> and so they're hearing something. So the tactical person, that's the key down to the front line. This communication gets real fast between these roles you know, it's almost like daily, is that fair to say, Dr. Micah, between the tactical and the operational? And you've got staff coordinators. It's a typical position, I think, of that that's their job, right? To calibrate between the tactical and the operational role. This communication up here should work slower than the communication between the bottom two. Because if it works too fast, the senior leader team or the tactical team can't make adjustments quickly enough to keep up with all the policy changes that are going on. And there's just a certain point where it's just like, we, we can't write enough guidelines or regulations to keep up with everything that's just turning over. So a little slower, big picture up here, quicker and, and needing more agility. And you all all talked as a strength. You saw a lot of agility down here at the front line, right? in the last 18 months, and you said you appreciated that, that's the way it should work. You know, imagine if one of y'all showed up and said, I don't think we should be, you know, doing free Wi-Fi out of a bus in the neighborhood, you know, but yet that's what had been decided to happen. That, you know, that would seem uh, ludicrous. So does that help with your question about you, you, this? The superintendent is kind of between these two roles. Sure. No, Just, that... that that really just verified my thinking anyway. And to the, uh, thank you ma'am, and to mm -hmm. the, um, to, and I said I was going to try to just be neutral earlier, but I kind of responded because when I heard, you know, the listening, the concern, or not concern, but the kind of like tension that welled up in me real quickly, you know, to that is that so you're taking someone from the strategic role and you're going down here and you're sitting down in the operational role. And it's okay, but I mean, I even talked to 
but it's, it's tough. It's challenging because now we've got a strategic role member down at the operational role maybe saying something that's not consistent with what a curriculum coordinator just told them 30 minutes before. That's, this is the protocol that we're following because TEA changed some guideline. So, I mean, that's like the real practical. So that's kind of why so I said, oh, you know, that, you know that's, that's a challenge. You can do it, but it's a, it's a lot of work. So anyway, I just want to clarify that with you, too. That Consistent messaging and making sure that it's accurate. Yeah, and, that, and by the way, messaging is uh, an interesting choice of words there because there should be different messaging coming from the different roles. Like the, the, the terminology and the language, you don't use operational role language to communicate strategic role thoughts and vice versa. So, you know, it's, you have to think about, I, I just, I believe strongly in these three essential roles, it's not inconsistent with TASB. TASB's above the line, it was right here, uh, Ms. Huey. You, but it just draws this bifurcation between, and then for superintendents, especially in districts this size, I'm sure Dr. Micah operates this way because I happen to, you know, enough, know enough about his structure. He, he wouldn't want to inconsistently communicate um, with someone that he's hired to be the communicator to the front line, right? So he would want to protect that structure between the tactical role and the operational role. I couldn't imagine you, Dr. Michael, wanting to be in a classroom telling a teacher what to do. I guess that's what I'm saying, because you've got a lot of folks that, you know, are trained specifically to do that. Now, to show up as the CEO and um, put a listening ear out to uh, help you have feedback to feed back up to the strategic team? Sure, absolutely. But to go, and I just remember in my previous district, Dr. Gibson, go on a walkthrough with us. Okay, I'm happy to, but I want it to be clear I'm there just for eye candy. I'm, I mean, th this is just a Twitter moment. This is not, <laughs> this is not, I'm, I'm not in there because, well, but you, your background's curriculum, Dr. Gibson. I haven't done that for 22 years. I've overseen it for 21 years, but I haven't done it for 22 years, and that's a whole different structure. It, to be the overseer of it, I mean, I know what questions to ask if we're getting results or not, but I don't know exactly what to tell a frontline teacher what to do with respect to the curriculum. Fair enough? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, I was just going to, to piggyback off of that, <laughs> I wanted to say that. Um, I was just gonna say it, it, it also, um, what word am I looking for? Maybe misaligns expectations when, you know, you go and you say, well, I'm just listening. Um, those that are there expect more yeah. from you than just, they hear you say, they hear you say that, but in their mind, they're like, oh, good, they're here. They're going to do something, and I can ask them to do something. Yes. And it's like, no. And yes. then, you know, when you don't, then, you know, they get disappointed because they didn't hear anything back from you. Not right. understanding that you really can't do anything by yourself or on your own, or that we work as a collective board. That's a really astute observation. I mean, it really is. So it, it's almost like managing expectations on the other side. And the, this, you know, this structure is not um, one that is typically thought of with the folks that reside in the mm -hmm. operational role. I mean, just plain and simple. It's just this like just to talk about this whole structure. And if you start into it, because I've tried before, it's like, I don't have time to do that. I'm teaching third graders how to read, you know, y'all figure all that out. But it, that's a good point, Ms. Williams, that it's hard, it's just hard to cross communicate. It doesn't mean it doesn't need to occur, but you have to rely on the administrators and the superintendent to be those pivot points. That's why aren't they're in those boxes over to the side of those levels, because they become the voice from up to down, the uh, superintendent initially, and then the, his tactical team, which, uh, he probably has two or three tiers of that. He has some direct reports, and then he has probably a cabinet of people that are over the, you know, all the downlines, and then you probably put cabinet plus principals together every once in a while, and it's probably a couple hundred people in a room, if I'm guessing. Is that fair to say? So that, that communication, and I was in a district last night with 300 uh, uh, staff members, and I was in a district Monday night with 300 students. Okay, if you follow, you know, so 
And they were talking about staying in their lane. And they've got 80 employees and two administrators, one elementary, one pre-K through eight, and, or pre-K through six, and one seven through 12. And they're still talking about staying in their lane. So I just I find that interesting. But it's the same model even for a district that size. OK, real quickly, and uh, then we're going to take a quick break and make a, a decision on debriefing that data from earlier. Um, I, I just was uh, listening to the superintendent the other day, and I'm holding up. And this model is one that we've used. It's a lining arrows model. And as I, and I, as I heard him talking the other day to me during our intake, uh, which is a short, quick meeting just to get a feel for uh, things before we come do training, I, I, that model came to mind as what I think is a good graphic representation of what Dr. Micah's goal is moving forward. Is that a fair assumption, Dr. Micah? Yes, sir. And so I, that's why I threw it in the packet tonight because it's not, I, and by the way, at level one, when those arrows are going in different direction, there's, there, the assumption on that level one is that there are no bad actors in any of those arrows, no matter which direction they're going. No one's doing the wrong thing. It's just they're not all doing the same thing. So there's no right or wrong with that. It's just lacking alignment. In most organizations, unless there is an intentional and aggressive effort, live somewhere in level one and level two. That's kind of our Baldridge, you know, belief that, you, you know, that's just, and they're in, the, if they get in kind of midway in level two, they're feeling like we're strategically aligned, not even realizing that, I mean, there's true, you know, there, there are, uh, I believe to be more integrated approaches even around. So let me put it this way. So level one, you know, no strategic direction. Level two, strategic direction that people can at least point their finger to, you know, and say, there it is, or I know where it is. And then level three, that document, whatever form it is, exists, and we look at it regularly. Level four, our efforts are completely integrated. I would never, you know, not help one of my colleagues do their part of whatever we're working on towards the strategic vision of the district. You know, that's level four. And it's, it's hard to define it and it's hard to quantify it. That's part of what we did as Baldridge examiners is try to quantify it. Um, we would ask them, what's your process for this or how do you do that? We would get the answer from the mid-level management team and from the senior level team. And then we would go to the front line and ask them the same question. And we were probing to see if there was an integrated approach all the way from the top to the bottom, right? And it's hard to make that happen, and it's it's harder in the larger you know the district gets or, or organization gets, but it is doable. So anyway, I know that's Dr. Micah's vision, and then I couldn't help myself. I just wanted to put this in here because my additional thought was that if the course of that uh, activity, which I would think ultimately is to incre increase or improve uh, organizational performance, which is um, I always just get it backwards, X or Y, I don't know, but this axis right here, whatever this <laughs> one is, I was, that's why? Okay, th all right, I was social studies and social sciences. But I, although I understand graphs and charts a lot, um, mm. but if you, the, the, um, the notion here is, you know, you, of course you want to be up high and to the right, you know, that you, so you want to have high morale and high performance, right? That's the goal. And you can go from bad in the lower left corner to good in the middle with a straight line. And, and meaning you can tighten some things up and you can do it you know, without a lot of change. Usually, but you, you just kind of tighten up procedures and you, so it's, it's just a straight line. But when you start trying to go from good to great, you have to make enough change usually when you do that that you can see potentially a slip. It doesn't have to be that way but you've got to tweak some things enough. And you know, it's funny in surveys, 90% of people uh, appreciate and want change. And then only 20% of people want change to be done to them. To them. Mm -hmm. Change is tough. So 90% want it, but only 20% are okay if it happens to them. So that's the incongruency that just makes this implementation dip 
happen. So it's just eyes wide open as you move forward. If, like if you're going to move something, just know that that C curve is always there. That um, Dr. Micah and President Groner, that, um, that kind of completes that first part one and part two. And if you want to debrief those team trust results, Peggy, are they ready? And they're ready. Okay, so we can adjourn into executive session. And the time is 6.58. So we're going to adjourn um, item three, executive session, personnel pursuant to government code section 551.074, a discussion regarding board evaluation and training related to performance of duties. And it was 658. Okay, the board will now reconvene into open session. The time is 810, and the board will now, item five, adjourn at 810. Thank you all for being here.